I'm super excited to be joined by my Secret Math Tutor YouTube channel here, along with Mario's Math Tutoring, to go through this final exam review with you. Algebra 1, I'll have a link in the description below where you can download this free worksheet if you want to follow along and do these problems. Let's get started into part 1. I'm going to be working through the odds, and my Secret Math Tutor is going to be doing the even. So the first problem, we have 7 minus 2 times the quantity 3x plus 1 equals negative 7. How do we solve for x? Well, if it's a multiple choice problem, you know, you can always put in, you know, whatever the values are, E, B, C, D, E, in for X and see if they equal negative seven. That's always an option if it's like a multiple choice test. But if you're trying to solve for X and you're trying to show your work algebraically, what you want to do is you want to simplify this left side here first, okay? Simplify the left side as much as you can, simplify the right side as much as you can. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to distribute not two into the parentheses, but see that minus two, you can think of this as a negative two. And so I'm going to be distributing, meaning I'm going to be multiplying that into the parentheses. See how these are right next to each other with nothing in between? That means times or multiply. So if we do that, we get negative six x minus two, and then we still have the seven I'm bringing down, equals negative seven. So the next thing we want to do is we want to combine like terms, okay? So the seven and the negative two uh, add up to positive five, bring down the negative six, Okay, now what we want to do is we want to get the variables on one side, numbers on the other. You want to separate them. So in order to do that, I want to get the, uh, I have the variables on the left, I want to get the numbers on the right. To get the numbers on the right, I have to get rid of them on the left. I'm going to do that by subtracting 5 from both sides. So if we do that, we get negative 12. These cancel. We have negative 6 equals negative 12. And the last step is, you know, we just want to get one of the x's by itself, just get that variable x by itself. So the opposite of multiplying by negative 6 would be to divide both sides by negative 6. You want to make sure you do it to both sides to keep it balanced. These are going to cancel one another out, and we get x equals positive 2, because a negative divided by a negative is a positive. Now, if you want to check your work and you have time, go ahead and put that 2 back in for x, you know, and simplify and make sure you get negative 7, then you know you've got it correct. Let's go ahead and look at a problem. In this problem, we're tasked with solving the equation 2x minus 7 all divided by 3 is equal to x divided by 12. In order to solve something like this, we might work on getting a common denominator here on the bottom. So I could multiply the top and bottom of this equation on the left side here by 4. Now, of course, what's that going to do is it's going to give us a 12 in the bottom. And we're going to have to go through and distribute in that top piece. So I'll give us an 8x minus a 28, all divided by, and in the bottom we're getting that 12, equals x divided by 12. Now you can really see the importance of doing that. Since the denominators or the bottoms are equal, it means that the tops or the numerators must also be equal. So we'll only need to focus on those top pieces. Excellent. Now that we have those, we can work on getting the x's together and really isolating it. So let's go ahead and subtract an x from both sides. That looks like a pretty good idea. So we'll get a 7x minus 28 is equal to 0. And we can move that 28 to the other side as well. All right, this one is almost done. One last step. Divide both sides by a 7. And 7 goes into 28 four times. So then we have our solution that x is equal to 4. Okay, let's go to number three now. So here what we have is we have an absolute value. See those uh, vertical bars, absolute value bars? So to solve an absolute value problem, what you want to do is you want to try to get that absolute value portion by itself on one side of the equal sign. So because the negative four and the absolute value are right next to each other, that means multiplication, right? We're going to do the opposite. We're going to divide both sides by negative four. Okay, so those cancel out. We have the absolute value of 2x minus 1 equals positive 3 because a negative divided by a negative. But then what you want to do from here is you want to actually split this up into two equations. See, whatever was in here originally could have been negative 3, and when you take the absolute value, that makes it positive 3. Or it could have been positive 3. When you take the absolute value, that's also going to be positive 3. So the absolute value always makes it positive. So kind of working backwards, we're going to break this up into 2x minus 1 equals negative 3 or 2x minus 1 equals positive 3. And remember, in math, or actually means both, right? It means union, not like one or the other. It's actually both. So we're going to add 1 to both sides, okay? 
So if we do that, these are going to cancel. We get 2x equals negative 2. And then instead of multiplying by 2, we're going to divide both sides by 2. And that comes out to negative 1. Over here, we're going to add 1 to both sides. Okay, so that comes out to 2x equals 4. Instead of multiplying by 2, we're going to divide both sides by 2 and x equals 2. Now again, if you want to check your work, that's the nice thing about algebra. Oftentimes you can just take those values, put them back in, and make sure that you know they work out. In this problem, we want to find the percent of change. Now of course, there's a wonderful formula for this that you can use. Uh, and that formula essentially goes that you want to take your new price, subtract out the old price, and divide everything by your original or the old price. How that applies to our particular problem is we see that the new price is $60, whereas the old price was $50, and we're going to divide that by the old price of $50. All right, so we just have a little bit of math here to work out. Uh, 60 minus 50 will give us a 10, all divided by 50. And 10 divided by 50 is the same as 1 fifth, or written as a decimal, 0.2. Now, of course, we want the percent of change, so we definitely want to write this as a percent. So let's go ahead and move that decimal place over two times, and we will call this 20%. So that would be the percent of change if our original price is 50, and it now gets bumped up to 60. Okay, number five, what we want to do here is we want to graph these points. Okay, you know, plot these points, and then we want to label which quadrant that they fall into. Now, the important thing to remember is that you want to start over here in this upper right hand corner, this is our first quadrant, or we could use Roman numeral one, second quadrant, third quadrant, and fourth quadrant. So it goes counterclockwise like that from the upper right hand corner. And the other thing you want to pay attention to is it's just like alphabetical order. See, it's like X comma Y. So we're going X left and right, Y up and down. So I usually just do the X first. So negative two, we start at the origin, left two, and then minus three tells us to go down three, one, two, three, right about there. I'll just label that point A, okay? And that's in the third quadrant. So here we'll just write right here, one, two, three. Okay, for a letter B now, this point, four comma negative one. So we have one, two, three, four, down one. That's point B, and you can see that it's in quadrant four. Uh, number C here, three comma two. So we're going right three on the X, up two on the Y, and that's point C. And that's in quadrant number one. And then uh, letter D here, negative two, three. So we start here, we're going left two, up three. So that puts us <clears throat> right here in quadrant number two. And let's label that point D. So remember, it's just like a number line. To the right is positive, to the left is negative, down is negative, up is positive and you've got your points. All right, for this problem, we're, cry we're trying to determine if the point negative four, one is a solution to this linear equation. Two X minus three Y is equal to negative 11. When we're given a point like this and trying to determine if it's a solution, you really want to think of this point as an X, Y pair. So our first number is an X, our second number is a Y. And to determine if it's a solution, we simply substitute these values in for X and Y and see if it is true. So this I'll write out as 2, my x is a negative 4, my y is a 1, and of course we're trying to determine if this is really equal to negative 11, so I'm going to put a little question mark over that equal sign. I'm also going to be careful not to move things across that equal sign. It's really like we're trying to verify uh, whether these two things are the same, so I don't want to necessarily jump to conclusions. All right, let's see what we got. Over here I have negative 8 minus 3. If I combine those, I will get a negative 11. And sure enough, that is exactly what we have on the other side. So these two things are equal. Since they are equal, we can say that uh, negative 4, 1 is a solution. For number 7, we want to graph these lines okay, in the coordinate plane. So for A, we have x equals negative 2. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes students get a little bit confused because they see the x-axis going left and right like this, and they, th they think maybe that x equals lines also go left and right or horizontal like that. But what you can do if you get stuck is just to make a little table. So what I'm going to do is just make a table, and I'm going to say, well, if y is 1, 
x is negative 2. If y is 2, x is negative 2. If y is 3, x is negative 2. You can see no matter what y is, x is always negative 2. If we plot these points, negative 2, 1, negative 2, 2, negative 2, 3, ah, you see we're actually getting a vertical line and x equals negative 2. Now some students just choose to you know, memorize that x equals lines are vertical, y equals lines are horizontal, but again if you forget, so let's just label this uh, for A, line A. For B now we have y equals 3. So just like we said, y equals lines are horizontal lines, this line is going to look like this. I'll just label that B. And then for C, we have y equals zero. Now this one's confusing sometimes for students because we said that y equals lines are horizontal lines. But zero means that we're not going up or down. We're going to be right on the x-axis. It's a little bit tough to graph because it kind of blends in with the x-axis. But I'll just label this uh, for letter C, y equals zero, a horizontal line. And then uh, dx equals zero, you can probably guess that's going to actually be the y-axis. Remember, x equals lines are vertical lines. So I'll just kind of draw this in a little bit darker here like this, and we'll label that D. For this problem, we want to find the x and the y-intercepts of the equation negative 3x plus 5y is equal to negative 15. Anytime we're looking for those intercepts, uh, you want to make sure that you understand that one of the values, either x or y, will be zero. For example, let's go ahead and find the x-intercept first. So we're thinking, where does it cross the x-axis? Uh, where it crosses the x-axis, y will be 0. I know that seems backwards, but it really is what we need. All right, so I've put in a 0 for the y. Notice how it's going to eliminate this term since 5 times 0 is just 0. So we'll just be left with a 3x equals a negative 15. And then we can divide all of that by a negative 3. So we'll get a nice positive 5 out of this. All right, so how can we write that? So when x is 5, y is, of course, 0. And this is our x-intercept um, at 5, 0. Similarly, we can go ahead and find the y-intercept. So we'll write out the equation, but this time, x is going to be the 0 piece. All right, so y is in there. Everything else is the same. And now we go trying to solve for y. Much like before, this term is going to go away since I have a negative 3 times a 0. So that is just 0, and it's gone. I have a 5y equals a negative 15, and now I can divide both sides of this by 5. So this will give me a uh, negative 3. All right, so now we can write this out as a point. So when x is 0, so when x is 0, y is negative 3. Nice. Okay, number 9. We want to find the slope. Okay, for letter A, they're giving us two points. We want to find the slope of that line that goes through those two points. The important thing for this problem is you want to know your slope formula. So your slope formula is this one right here. You might want to add this to your note sheet. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Okay, now when you look at the two points, you can call this point 1 or this point 1, this point 2 or this point 2. But I'm going to pick this first one, I'm going to call it point 1. So this is x1, comma y1, that just means point 1, and then x2, y2. So I'm, all I'm going to do now is substitute in the values. So we have negative 6 minus 1 over negative 3 minus negative 2. Now remember, when you subtract, it's like adding the opposite. So we get negative 7 over negative 1, which equals positive 7. So this one has a slope of 7. For letter B, x equals negative 2, remember we talked about graphing earlier, x equals lines, these are vertical lines, and vertical lines actually have an undefined slope. So you can either write the word undefined, or you can draw this zero with like a line through it. I'm just going to write undefined. For letter C, y equals 3, remember y equals lines, we talked about our horizontal lines, okay, and you can see it's not going up to the right. It's not going down to the right, it's not negative, it's horizontal, it's a slope of zero. So we're going to write m equals zero. And for letter D, we have another one where we have two coordinates. We want to find the slope. So back to our slope formula. Again, I'm going to call this point one, so x1, y1. I'm going to call this one point two, x2, y2. So we've got eight minus two over negative four minus negative four. Now remember, when you subtract, it's like adding the opposite. 
8 minus 2 is 6, negative 4 plus 4 is 0. We can't divide by 0, that's undefined. So this has an undefined slope, meaning that it's going to be a vertical line if you plot those points. Now, if you were to get something like this, 0 divided by 6, so the numerator is 0 and the denominator is not 0, this would equal 0. So sometimes students get confused by that a little bit. 0 in the numerator is 0, 0 in the denominator is undefined. So in this case, for uh, letter D, we set undefined slope. For this problem, we want to find the slope and the y-intercept of 2x minus 3y is equal to 18. All right, let's see what we got for this one. For the slope and the y-intercept, it's probably best to put this into slope-intercept form. That's the one where we have y all by itself. Uh, and then the other terms here for m and b will represent the slope and the y-intercept. So it's a really handy form to get what we want out of here. Uh, so to get it closer to that form, we need to move the x term to the other side. So we'll just subtract it. And then we'll need to divide everything by that negative 3. So negative 2 divided by a negative 3 is a positive 2 thirds. 18 divided by a negative 3. Uh, this will be a negative as well, and it'll be a negative 6. All right, so now it's in that form. Let's go ahead and highlight the things we want here. This 2 thirds is what we would call the slope. And the negative 6, there's our y-intercept, negative 6. So it's all about getting it in that right form and then just reading off really what you want. Number 11, we want to write an equation of a line that goes through uh, this point and has a slope of negative 1 half. Now, you can do this two different ways, and I'm going to show you both ways. The first way, we're going to use the point-slope form of the equation of a line. y1 and x1, that's your point, and m, that's your slope. So let's do it that way first. So we have y minus the y-coordinate of the point equals the slope times x minus the x-coordinate of the point. Now, we can get this y by itself by adding 3 to the other side, but first let's distribute the negative 1 half. So that's going to be negative 1 half x. 8, you can think of it as like 8 over 1, so you multiply the numerators together, that's positive 8, the denominators together, that's 2, a negative times a negative is a positive, so we get 4, okay? And then here we have y minus 3, and then I'm going to add 3 to both sides, so we get y equals negative 1 half x plus 7. Now you can see it's in the y equals mx plus b form of the equation of a line, the slope-intercept form. But a lot of students are just used to working with the slope-intercept form, so let me show you that way. So you would put in the slope, which is negative 1 half. Okay, that goes in for m. But we don't know what the b value is. So what we can do is we can take these uh, x and y values and substitute them in. So y equals 3, x is 8, which we said was like 8 over 1. And you can see that's negative 8 over 2, which reduces to negative 4. And now we just want to get b by itself, so instead of subtracting 4, we're going to add 4 to both sides. So b equals 7, we're going to put that 7 back in for b right there, and you can see y equals negative 1 half x plus 7, just like we got doing it the first way. So either way will work, whatever way you prefer. In this problem about lines, we're curious whether they are parallel, perpendicular, or neither. This type of question is really talking about the slopes of the two lines. They could be the same, parallel, they could be opposite reciprocals of one another, what we say perpendicular, or they could actually just be some two lines that really are not parallel or perpendicular, what we would say just are neither. The key for really seeing whether this happens is to compare the two slopes, and it'd be nice if both of them were in that y equals mx plus b form. If they were, then we could just look at the m term, that'd be our slope, and we could quickly determine if they were parallel or not. Let's do a little bit of work with this second equation here and get it into that y equals mxb form. Uh, that way we can better compare the slopes. So what I'm doing here is I'm subtracting the 10x to the other side. That looks good. And let's divide everything by a negative 5. So 10 divided by a negative 5 is a positive 2. 8 divided by a negative 5 will be a negative 8 fifths. There we go. And now we can take a much closer look at our slopes. So here's the slope of our first line, here's the slope of that second line, and we can immediately tell that they're not the same, so they are not parallel. They are not opposite reciprocals of one another. They're close. They are very close. 
If they were opposite reciprocals, we'd see something like one half and negative two, or we'd see something like a negative one half and a positive two. They'd really have to be opposite in signs. But since we're not seeing that, we only get the last option. These two are neither parallel nor perpendicular. Let's try that same technique for our second set of lines. This second one is already in our y equals mx b plus form, but the first one is not. So we'll do a little bit of work with this one by moving the 3x to the other side. That'll give us a negative 3x. And then we'll need to divide through by the negative 6. So negative 3 divided by negative 6 will give us a 1 half. Uh, negative 9 divided by negative 6. Uh, we could reduce that, but I'm just going to leave it as negative 9, 6. So we're not really worried about the y-intercept anyway. All right, now let's go ahead and make a comparison. So there's my slope of the second line. Here's my slope of the first line. And in this case, they are exactly the same. So we would say that these two lines are parallel. Okay, number 13, we have graph and state the domain and range of this function. Well, notice these vertical bars here. This is an absolute value graph. And you probably remember the absolute value graphs had this V-like shape, okay? And what we can do is we can do this a couple different ways. We can use transformations. Uh, one way to do it is if you look at the general form of an absolute value equation, y equals a times the absolute value of x minus h plus k, the h and the k pick up the graph and shift it left and right, up and down. The one that's grouped with the x is going to shift it in the horizontal direction, but it has the opposite effect. So if it was like minus one, it would actually go to, to the right one. If it was plus one, it would actually go to the left one. The k, that's a vertical uh, shift. If it's plus two, it would actually go up two. If it was minus two, it would go down two. So just remember the one that's grouped with the x has the opposite effect. And then the a is involved with stretching the graph. If a is greater than one, compressing the graph if it's between zero and one. And if it's negative, it's going to reflect it over the x-axis. So a couple different ways to do this problem, but notice that this one here is not being shifted left or right, but it is being shifted down too. We could think of this as like our vertex, this point here where the graph bends. And then the one half, this is like a shrink, but another way to do this is to think of this as like the slope. You can say from this point, we're going rise one, run two, rise one, run two. And because you can see it's symmetric on both sides of this vertex, you can repeat that same process, rise one, and then go the other direction, two. And then you can see you're getting like a real nice uh, V-shaped graph. The one half is compressing it, which is making it wider. The other way to do this problem, if you want, is to focus on graphing just this part, y equals one half absolute value of x. Just make like a table. And then what you can do, once you get those values, plot the graph and then shift it down two. So that's another option if you want. Okay, now speaking of the domain and the range, when we talk about domain, domain means like what can the x values be? So we think about, what I normally do is I take like a, a vertical line like this and I scan across the x-axis from left to right. See how the graph is going to the left and the right forever and ever? So the x values can be anything. Uh, x can be three, there's a point on the graph, x can be four, x can be five, etc. So here what we're gonna do is we're gonna say the domain is all real numbers. You can use this symbol here, or you could write all reals. Now for the range, we're talking about what can the y values be. I take a horizontal line, like I take my marker here like this horizontally, and I scan from like low to high, like this direction. See how there's not any y values down here? There's not any points down here. Only until we get to negative two or higher to see this across the graph. So the y values are gonna be at negative two, or greater, so I'm gonna say range is y is greater than or equal to negative two, and you got it. All right, in this set of problems, we wanna solve and then graph the solution on a number line. The reason why we're going for a number line in these two instances is both of these are inequalities. So there's actually lots of different solutions, and a really good way to represent all of those solutions is really just graphing them out. So to solve this, we want to work on isolating x, getting it all by itself. To start that off, let's go ahead and add three to all of our pieces. So we'll add a three to the middle piece, we'll add a three to the left and right one. This will give us a uh, negative three is less than a three x less than or equal to uh, 15. Okay, that x is still not quite isolated. Let's go ahead and divide everything by the positive three. So 
So let's see what we get for that. We'll get a negative 1 less than x less than or equal to 5. All right, so it looks like x uh, is our number, and it could be some number between negative 1, not inclusive, uh, up to 5, and that is inclusive. So if we're drawing this out on a nice number line, we want to include those endpoints and everything in between. So I'm going to use this uh, open parentheses, or sometimes you might see an open circle at negative 1. And we'll do a hard bracket. Sometimes you might see a, a closed circle at 5. And we'll go ahead and shade in everything in between. There we go. So as long as I'm between those two spots or inclusive of 5, then I know I have a solution. All right, let's try that second problem. We'll see in the second one, we're still dealing with an inequality, but this time it's connected with or. So we'll solve each problem separately, and then go ahead and look at the combined solution when we get to that number line. All right, let's see what we've got. So the first step, we're going to add 9 to both sides. This will give us a negative 2x greater than, and this will be a, a 20. All right, that's looking good. Now we'll go ahead and divide both sides by negative 2. Be careful when dividing or multiplying by negative numbers, uh, especially when you're dealing with an inequality like this. It flips your inequality symbol around. So this would be x is less than, and now we do the math over here just as we normally would, and this is giving us a negative 10. So x is less than a negative 10. All right, moving on over here, getting x all by itself, we will add 3 to both sides, so plus a 3. Plus a 3. So x is greater than or equal to. Negative 7 plus 3 is a negative 4. Notice how we're not really worried about flipping the sign here because we are not multiplying. Only when you multiply or divide. Uh, all right, so we have two solutions that x is less than negative 10 or x is greater than or equal to a negative 4. So we want those two places on the number line. And since it could be in one or the other, we'll go ahead and graph them both. Let's see, negative 10 is on the left here, so we'll put negative 10. I'll use that parentheses to show that I don't really want to include the negative 10. And x could be smaller than that, so we will shade everything lower. We also want to say uh, negative 4, so it's to the right of negative 10. And it could be greater than, so we'll shade to the right of that. So I really have these two intervals. Nice. Okay, number 15. It says graph the inequalities in the xy coordinate plane. So we've got two different examples. Now the first one, letter A, see how y is by itself? A lot of students find that it's easier just to get the y by itself and then graph. And this one already is, so it's in the slope intercept form. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find that y intercept, one, two, three, four, five, six, crosses right there at six. The slope is negative one half, so from here we're going down one, over two, down one, over two. And notice how it's less than but not equal to. That means that this is going to be a dashed or dotted line. If it was equal to, it would be a solid line, meaning that it includes the points on that, on that line. But you see how the y values are less than? The y controls the vertical direction up and down. So if the y values are less than, we're shading below that line. And so you could shade straight down like so. Now another way to do this is to pick a test point. And a good test point to pick is the origin. 0, 0. And what you would do is you would put 0 in for y, 0 in for x. So that comes out to 0 is less than 6. So that's actually true. 0 is less than 6. So that's the side of the plane, okay, the side of this line that you want to shade. If it was false, then you would shade the other side. So two different options, test point method or less than below, greater than above. The y controls the vertical direction. For letter B, notice how the variables are both on the left side of this inequality. So you can either rearrange the inequality to get the y by itself, or you can do the intercept method. So if you set x equal to 0, let's make a little table here, then divide by negative 5, y would be 2. And if you set y to 0, divide by 2, x is going to be negative 5. So all we did right there was just find the intercepts. So we have 0, 2, and negative 5, 0. It's less than or equal to in this case, so it's going to be a solid line, okay? And then now you don't want to make this mistake where you say, oh, this is less than, you know, Mario told me to shade below. That only works if the y is by itself, right? 
So what we're going to do here is we're going to do the test point method. I'm going to put in 0, 0, okay, which is this origin point right here. 0 minus 0, that's 0. Is 0 less than or equal to negative 10? No, 0 is actually greater than all the negative numbers. So this point here is false. We don't want to shade on this side. We want to shade on the other side. Now, if that seems too complicated, just rearrange this equation. Get the y by itself. So let's go ahead and do that method. So we're going to subtract 2x from both sides. So negative 5y is less than or equal to negative 2x minus 10. Then we're going to divide everything by negative 5 to get the y by itself. So these are going to cancel. You get y is, okay, 2 fifths x plus 2. But remember, when you multiply or divide both sides of an inequality by a negative number, what happens to the sign? That inequality sign actually flips. So now this is greater than, and now it's making sense, you know, in the context of what we did in the letter A. The plus 2, that's your y-intercept. The slope is 2 fifths, and greater than or equal to or shading above or on that line. Any point in this region will make this inequality true. For this problem, we want to solve a system of equations using the substitution method. The idea is that we already have the first equation solved for x, so I can take what it's equal to and put it in the second equation. Watch how this goes. So the second equation is x minus a 3y equals negative 1. But instead of putting that x there, since the first one is already solved for x, we will put what it's equal to. So I've replaced x with 2y minus 4. All right, now I have an equation that only has y's in it, so we'll get the y's all by itself. So 2y minus 4 minus 3y equals negative 1. That looks good. I can combine together the y's. So a positive 2 and a negative 3 gives me a negative 1. Now I can work on getting y all by itself. So let's add 4 to both sides. And multiply by a negative 1. And we'll see that we get a negative 3 for the y. So that's looking pretty good. Now that we have one variable, we can go ahead and put it back into either one of our equations. And we'll get the x variable. Since the first one is already solved for x, it's probably a good place to put it. So we'll go ahead with that one. x is equal to 2y. Y in this case being a negative 3. And now we'll just go ahead and do a little bit of algebra and see what x is equal to. So 2 times a negative 3 is a negative 6. Negative 6 minus 4 is a negative 10. So we have x is equal to negative 10. Uh, we can either write this as a ordered pair, where I have my x and y, or you can just go ahead and leave it as x equals negative 10, y equals negative 3, as long as it's clear what each of the variables represent. Okay, number 17, it says solve the system using the elimination method. So when we do the elimination method, we're trying to add these two equations together to eliminate either the x's or the y's, or you can subtract the equations and eliminate the x's or the y's. I usually find adding to be easier, most students uh, normally do. So ideally what we want when we try to combine these is we want one of the quantities to be negative, one of the quantities to be positive, and we want them to have the same coefficients, so when we add them together, they'll cancel out. So the question for this one is, do we want to eliminate the x's or the y's? Here you can see that, you know, it's, there's not like a really simple way to do this one. We're going to have to multiply both equations by a constant. And it looks like 3 and 2, the lowest common multiple is 6. So I'm going to multiply this top equation by 2. That's going to give us negative 6y. I'm going to multiply this bottom equation by 3. This is going to give us positive 6y. Then when we add them together, the y's will cancel out. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's distribute the 2 to everything in this equation. That's going to make this 8x minus 6y equals 20. And when we distribute the 3, we get 15x plus 6y equals 3. Now if we add straight down, see how the y's are going to cancel out. We get 23x equals 23. And we just want to solve for x by dividing both sides by 23. And you can see that x equals 1. Now if we take the 1, we can put it back in for this x or this x or this x or this x. It doesn't matter. Any one of the equations will work. I'll just do this top one here. 4 times x is 1 minus 3y equals 10. So this is 4. If we subtract 4 from both sides, we get negative 3y equals 6. Divide both sides by negative 3. And you can see that y is going to come out to negative 2. And so our final answer, we want to write it as a coordinate pair, 1 comma negative 2. This represents you know, where these two lines are 
crossing or intersecting. If you want to check your work, if you put 1 in for x, negative 2 in for y, you'll get 10. Same thing over here, you'll get 1. If it makes both equations true, you know you have that common point of intersection. All right, in this problem, we got a bunch of different little ones, and we're using the rules of exponents to simplify them as much as possible. Since we're using a lot of various different rules, sometimes you, you might see a certain rule and you can apply it. Go ahead and do so, uh, but always check it to see if there's any other rules that you can maybe later apply. All right, so when I'm looking at the first one here at the top, the thing that really strikes out at me is this two and the eight. Uh, I can reduce those. Two goes into eight four times. So that first part's really just going to be a one fourth. For our rules of exponents on the second piece, I can see that uh, I have a y in the top and a y in the bottom, so I can subtract their exponents. Uh, so let's go ahead and write this as 1 fourth. So that's the first piece right there. Then I'll say y of 3 minus 5. So there's where I'm using that rule, subtracting the exponents. Continuing on, 3 minus 5 is equal to a negative 2. So you can leave it like this, or if you want to turn it back into a fraction, that's completely okay. Remember that with negative exponents, they end up on the bottom. So this would be 1 divided by 4 y uh, squared. Nice. All right, on to the next one. For our rules of exponents here, we want to apply the 4 to both the terms on the inside. So this 4 will go on the 2, the negative 2, and it will also go on the um, x cubed. So negative 2 to the 4th power, that's the same as negative 2 times itself, 4 different times. Uh, that'll give us a positive 16. For the second piece, we can use our rules of exponents to multiply those exponents together. So this will be 3 times 4 in the top there. Multiplying 3 times 4, we get 12. And so this is equal to 16x to the 12th. All right, here's an interesting one. We see that both pieces are in parentheses, but really everything is just being multiplied together. So we could actually start combining things and saying, uh, well, what's 5 times a negative 2? And then what's an a times an a cubed? And a b squared times a b. So I'm really just uh, reshuffling the multiplication. And now we can go ahead and combine them. Uh, 5 times a negative 2 is a negative 10. The rules of exponents here would say we need to add the exponents. So I have a 1 and a 3. That'd be a to the fourth power. Adding the exponents for this one on the b's, 2 plus 1 would equal b to the third. All right, looking good. All right, the next one we have three different terms here. Again, they're all being multiplied, so we'll just really focus on their exponents. 2 plus 3 plus 0. 2 plus 3 plus 0 would be a 5, and so we're done with that one. Now, interestingly enough, that's not the only way you can do this one. You might also recognize that one of your rules for exponents says that anything to the zero power is one, so you could have actually reduced this and called it one and gotten the same answer. That's because you would end up combining these two, so x to the two plus three, and then you'd multiply that result by one, but hey, one multiplied by anything is itself, so you'd end up right back at x to the fifth. All right, one last one. Here we're dealing with a fraction to the third power, and you're going to apply that power of 3 to all of the terms. You're doing this because they're all being multiplied. So I have 2 to the 3rd, c to the 3rd, 3 to the 3rd, and this is a d squared to the 3rd. All right, for the numbers, we can go ahead and do the um, math in there. So 2 to the 3rd is 8, and I have c cubed. Off to the bottom, 3 cubed would be a 27. Here we use those rules of exponents to go ahead and multiply the two uh, terms. So 2 times 3 would be 6. All right, and that would be the last one on there. Okay, for number 19, we've got two parts, A and B. We want to write a scientific number in standard notation, like a regular number. And we want to write a standard number in scientific notation. So the key with scientific notation is you have a one-digit number from 1 to 9 in front of the decimal point. The rest of the remaining significant digits to the right or after the decimal point times 10 to a power. Now, when you think of scientific numbers, when you have a positive exponent here, this tells us that it's a really large number. When you have a negative exponent, this tells us it's a really small number. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, 
10 to the fifth really means 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. It's like five tens multiplied together. And you can visualize that you know, this is gonna be uh, 10,000, right? No, uh, 100,000, sorry, 100,000. And so if you were to multiply 2.57 times 100,000, uh, of course, that's gonna be a really large number. But an easy way to do this problem is if you have a positive exponent, just go ahead and move that, that number of places to the right, the decimal point. So you have 2.57. We're gonna move it one, two, three, four, five. And I'm gonna put my placeholders in here. So this is gonna be 257000, that's 257,000. Okay, for part B now, we're going the opposite direction. We have a standard number, we wanna put it into scientific notation like so. Again, we only want that single digit between you know, one to nine in front of the decimal point. We don't want two digits, three digits, right? No digits, we want just a single digit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, how many places would I have to move this decimal point? One, two, three, four places, that's 1.25 times 10 to the negative fourth. Now remember we said when it's a negative exponent, it's a very small number. When it's a positive exponent, it's a very large number. The other way to look at it is, see 10 to the negative fourth is really like one over 10 to the positive fourth because when you have a negative exponent, you take the reciprocal. So this is kind of like dividing by 10,000. Imagine if you took 1.25 and you divided it by 10,000, it would become very small. So that's the key is negative exponent, really small number, positive exponent, really large number, and you got it. All right, for this next problem, we're working to add, subtract, or multiply polynomials depending on how they're put together. There's bunches of them here, so let's go ahead and start with the first one. In the first one, we see that we're actually subtracting two polynomials. And we can tell because I have the first polynomial minus the second polynomial. For these, you really want to think of like terms. So here I have a term with x to the fifth, but there is no other x to the fifth term over here. So this is like two x to the fifth minus zero. So that will just be a two x to the fifth term. No changes for that one. Next, I'm looking for x to the fourth terms. I don't see any of those. And now I can move on to x to the third terms. And we do have one of these here. We don't have any over here. So really to take care of the x to the third terms, you wanna think of this as zero minus three x to the third. And because of that minus sign here, we're gonna pick up a negative sign on our term. All right, that takes care of that one. On to the x squareds, and I see that there are x squareds in both of our polynomials. So I have a negative three x squared minus a five x squared. Minus three minus a five will give us a combined minus eight x squared. All right, and on to our constant terms. Here we have a negative two minus four for a negative six. So this would be our combined polynomial. On to the next one. Here we're taking care of multiplication between two polynomials. Uh, for this, you wanna think of the distributive process. So this first little polynomial is going to go to all of the terms on the inside. And you're gonna do the numbers and the uh, variables as well. So two times three would equal six. Then I can use my rules for exponents to add the exponents together here. This will give us y to the fifth. And I'm on to the next term. Two times a negative seven is a negative 14. Take my y's and add their exponents. Three plus one is a four. Onto the last term, two times two is a four. There are no y terms here, or you can think of it as y to the zero power. So we'll just be left with y to the third as our last term. Right here again, we have multiplying of two polynomials. This is a good situation where we can use the FOIL method. So we'll take our first outside, inside, and last terms and put them together. Let's start off with those first terms. 2x times 4x would equal an 8x squared. Outside terms would be the 2x and the 1, so I'll give us just a 2x. Inside terms, negative 3 times 4 is a negative 12x. And the last terms, negative 3. So with our outside and inside, we can actually go ahead and combine those together. This will give us a polynomial of 8x squared minus 10x minus 3. Very nice. The next one we can also use FOIL, but I want to point out something that will save you a lot of time. 
Notice how these two polynomials are exactly the same, except for this little symbol right here. One has a plus sign and one has a minus sign. In cases where you're multiplying two binomials together like that, it means that your outside and your inside terms will be the same, but opposite in sign. Uh, the punchline to all of this is that they will drop away entirely. Don't worry, I won't skip that step. Let's go ahead and take a look at what happens. With the first two terms, 5y times a 5y will give us a 25y squared. The outside will be a negative 20y, and the inside will be a positive 20y. So they're the same, except for opposite and sign. And the last term, 4 times 4 is a 16. Since one of them is negative, that will give us a negative 16. The outside and inside terms will cancel away, since one is plus and one is minus, leaving us with just a 25y squared minus 16. All right, and one last one. Uh, this is also a good one that you can foil because you want to recognize that this too represents that we have another polynomial just like this one being multiplied by itself. Sometimes it's nice to actually go ahead and write these out in the expanded version or, or just so you can see that you really do have two of these multiplied together. Now you can also use a shortcut for this one since they are exactly the same. Essentially, your outside and inside terms will be the same, so you only have to compute one of those and then double it. But again, FOIL works pretty good, so I'll just look at all the steps and go from there. 2c times 2c would be 4c squared. Outside would be plus 6c, and inside is exactly the same, another plus 6c. My last terms are 3 times 3, which is 9. And then I can work to go ahead and combine those inner terms. So 4c squared plus 12c plus 9. And there we go, that's our last polynomial uh, for this set of problems. Okay, follow us over to part two. I'll have a link to the video right there where we'll continue on with this Algebra 1 final exam review.